Hi everyone, and welcome to this video where we look at a member of my classic computer collection. And today we're going to have a look at a computer from the early 1980s. It's a home computer, and it is quite famous, although not necessarily for the right reasons. It's the Texas Instruments TI-99-4A. Let's check it out. Texas Instruments invented the first transistor radio, integrated circuit, and handheld calculator. Given this lineage, it was the most natural thing in the world for the mega chip maker to get onto the personal computer bandwagon as it gathered speed in the late 1970s. Here is their first effort, the TI-99-4, released in 1979. Like the TRS-80 Model 1, the computer came with a monitor. However, being colour and sound enabled, it was about twice the price of the Model 1, which tended to put it beyond the range of families, especially when other models started to appear, which you could just plug into the TV. Speaking of those other models, here are some of the other main combatants in the home computer bear pit in 1980. The VIC-20, the TRS-80 Color Computer, and the Atari 400. As well as being inexpensive, the VIC-20 also had a full-stroke keyboard, which was viewed favourably by the public. In 1981, TI upgraded the machine to the TI-99-4A. Another graphics mode was added, and gone was the chiclet keyboard and the built-in calculator program. Most significant of all, the bundled screen was ditched, making the price competitive with the rest. Promoted by the late 1970s comedy icon Bill Cosby, the machine was promoted to North American families as a smart choice. Like all home computers of that era, the machine was inexpensive, idiosyncratic and unique. Cartridges allowed instant program loading, and programs could also be loaded from and saved to tape on the basic machine. The focus was on education, fun, computer literacy, and with a bit of expansion, letter writing, home accounts and the like. Colour, graphics, sound, and the ability to plug into the family TV was important. Like most of its competitors, it could also be expanded with expensive add-ons for more capability. These machines are rare here in New Zealand, so I consider myself lucky to have this PAL version. As you can see, it's quite an attractive case. I like the black and silver livery. That silver is actually aluminium, which gives it an aesthetic edge compared to the cheap plastic look and feel of other machines going for the same market, like the VIC-20, say. Apart from being QWERTY, the keyboard wasn't very standard. Mind you, I don't think there was such a thing as a standard keyboard on a home computer in 1981. There are not many keys on the TI-994A, and they're quite close together. To get some common characters and functions, like, say, the question mark or backspace, it requires pressing a function key along with another. The shift keys are quite small, and the enter key, which is one of the most important keys on a home computer, is about the size of the alphanumeric keys. In saying that, the keyboard is okay to type on, and, ha and it has a reasonable tactile feel. You'll note the plastic strip at the top showing the functions of some of those combination key presses. My machine arrived without one of these strips, and I didn't realise its importance, or even of its existence, until I played games which refer to aid or begin and other mysterious words. I couldn't find those labels on the keys. They were, of course, on the strip, and they referred to the combination key presses. Occupying a large chunk of the right-hand side is this runway for cartridges. These cartridges are simply guided into the slot at the rear. They push in just like that. I like this feature. Having the cartridges plug in there doesn't break up the clean lines of the computer. Other home computers of the time tended to have their cartridges hanging out the side or the back or maybe even the top. They just seem to look more untidy than the TI-99 4A once the cartridge is inserted. So let's remove our cartridge and have a look around the side. Now you can see around the side here uh, there's not a lot, except for the single card edge hidden under a sliding latch. 
this is where peripherals could be plugged in. Let me just uh, open that latch up for you so you can get a good view of it. It's just a small card edge. Most peripherals had a similar card edge on the right hand side, which meant you could chain a number of them together. One or two peripherals added this way was manageable, but the situation could get ridiculous when people really wanted to expand their machines to the maximum. Check out this photo for example. Kiss goodbye to all your desk space. This method of expansion is more a legacy of the TI 994, and Texas Instruments did bring out a rather large peripheral expansion box that you could plug in to this card edge. Here it is here. This box could hold one or two floppy drives and expansion cards. Unfortunately, I don't have one of these. Let's have a look at the rear end. The back's fairly sparse compared to the TI-994A's contemporaries. So we'll focus in on the left first, and there you'll see a socket for a tape recorder. It was expected that a standard tape recorder would be used with a computer, but you still needed the specific TI-99 for a cassette cable, so you could plug it into that D socket. In fact, a cable existed to allow you to control two tape recorders if you wished. Next to the cassette connection is the power socket for the external power supply unit. There is a power regulator in the computer itself underneath that cartridge runway, and according to Wikipedia, the external PSU is really just a step-down transformer. To the right we have the video socket. The cable attached to this socket goes into an RF, H, an RF modulator, which is a separate box. The signal is then taken to the aerial socket of the TV. I'll show you that RF box in just a moment. So if we swing round to the other side, and just shift it round, you can see there's a single D socket there. Uh, this is for twin TI joysticks. Although the socket was physically or is physically compatible with the common Atari type joysticks of the day, the wiring is not. So you had to use TI joysticks or buy an aftermarket adapter. Now I just thought I'd show you this photo that I found on the web because it shows what a fully decked out TI 994A might look like. You can see that expansion box at the back there is pretty humongous. If you compare it with the size of the console, that's, uh, that's quite a, a large square box. It does make a nice platform, I guess, for a monitor you know, that you could uh, place on top where the printer is. Here's an exploded view of the TI-994A. And you can see there that auxiliary board that's used for power regulation that I mentioned earlier on. One of the interesting things about the TI-99-4 series is that they are powered by a Texas Instruments 9900 16-bit CPU running at a blazing 3 MHz. Most other home computers at the time were using the 8-bit 6502, often at 1 MHz, or the Z80, which uh, often reached 2 MHz. This gave the advertising people something to go with, and the machine was touted as being the first 16-bit personal computer. In reality, though, the TI-994 circuitry was actually designed for an 8-bit TI chip that never eventuated, and the 9900 was dropped in at the last minute. The chip's advanced features and speed were therefore hobbled by the surrounding circuitry, which was never really designed for it. This is just a shot of my own main board. It took me a while to put together a TI-99 4A that was fully working. In fact, the machine I've got is a composite of three machines, each with different issues. If you're interested in how that came about, uh, you can check out my blog entry uh, on the uh, classiccomputers.org.nz website. Okay, let's have a look at the machine fully set up. So here it is on my workbench. You can see there a couple of cartridges. The TI Invaders one it doesn't work, unfortunately. There you can see uh, my cassette deck. Now that unit that's uh, plugged into the TI 
1994A there is a speech synthesizer. And these were pretty common peripherals for this particular model and gave it speech capability. Now, you know, I mentioned that every one of these accessories had that expansion slot on the right-hand side, and this one's no exception. You can see it there. So let's have a look at uh, the back. You can see the cassette cables plugged in. It's plugged in there, and the uh, PSU cable. That's the PSU. Of course, that's a 240-volt one. I don't know if that's an aftermarket one or not. I suspect it is, because there's no markings on it. Coming around here. Now, this is just for show. This joystick, uh, which is an Atari-compatible one, doesn't actually work, but I plug it in there. Uh, just to give the uh, illusion. And you can see there the RF modulator uh, tucked around the back. So you can see like a lot of these home machines of the era, there is quite a bit of uh, spaghetti there with various bits and pieces uh, that you need to run the machine, occupying a lot of desk real estate. Let's turn the machine on. And you do that by using a small slider switch under the cartridge runway here. Turn that on, we hear a beep, and there we have the colourful start-up screen. Now, a lot of other home computers of the era would default straight to basic, or if you had a cartridge plugged in, it would go straight to the cartridge, but the TI had a default boot-up screen, and then gave you the choice of either going into basic and ROM, or whatever cartridge you might have plugged in. We don't have a cartridge plugged in, so it doesn't give us a choice. Well, it just gives us one choice, and uh, it's, we're now in TI Basic. One of the interesting things about TI Basic, well, I found several interesting things, and one is that when you go to save or load from cassette, you're actually prompted or assisted a lot in what you actually need to do. So you can see those words that are appearing on the screen, instructing me step by step as to what I need to do with the tape recorder. So I guess this illustrates that it is a, or it was regarded a home friendly computer, um, which really held your hand as you uh, went along. But imagine though, after you're used to using it, uh, those sort of prompts would probably be quite annoying, and that you don't really need them anymore. So anyway, we've saved our, uh, our program uh, with that uh, sequence. Now here's something very unusual. It's the command used to load in a program that's been saved on a device like a cassette tape. And this command is old. Now, all other microcomputers of the day use the term load or maybe a derivative of that like C-load. But old? It's not even a verb. So it's a rather odd choice of a keyword to uh, load in your programs. But then again, that's what makes these computers interesting, the idiosyncrasies. So enough of that. Let's have a look at the computer at play. So I've just got a few selected games here, really to give you an idea of the graphics and the sound. Uh, there are various levels of sophistication, but in the main, um, pretty reasonable colours and uh, sound, typical of a home computer of that era. So this uh, is a game called, that was Demon Attack, this is a game called Blasto, which was a uh, tank game where you just wandered through a minefield. Um, clearing away for your little tank. Then we've got this one which was quite unusual. I, I, I've seen this one on another uh, YouTube video where someone's done a review of the TI. And uh, I haven't seen this game on any other platform. This is one where you climb up a mountain avoiding obstacles. It does use the speech synthesizer if it's plugged in as you can hear. So uh, you've got bears, you've got other um, things that might stop you and then at the end you get a prize you can a picture of yourself at the top with a bit of music to boot then we've got this game here I found this uh, pretty interesting this one is called 
Jawbreaker, and it's really a derivative of Pac-Man, in that you've got this um, eating machine here, gobbling things up. Uh, you've got sort of power balls at various ends, top and bottom of the screen, that if you uh, munch on those, you can uh, kill the enemy, or at least consume them. And then we've got this one here, this is Parsec. Here we are sweeping over uh, the surface of a moon, and the idea is to pick up these little guys here. Oops, sorry, sorry, fella. Uh, or to blast whatever else you can uh, see in front of you. This appears to be another favourite from reading uh, information on the web, and certainly it is fun to play. Again, it's a Pac-Man derivative. It's called Munch Man, and it seems to be very popular. Uh, it seemed to have been a very popular game for the. Uh, the TI 994A. Then we have this one, which was Parsec. Uh, a lot of video games uh, look like this. The idea is to uh, fly across a horizontally scrolling landscape and uh, dispatch your enemies. As you can see, I'm a pretty hopeless shot. Tombstone City, this involves you wandering around these blocks, which represent a town, and blasting your enemies, turning them into tombstones. Now the TI-994A sold itself as a, an educational machine, and many of the titles you can get on cartridges are of an educational nature, like this one here. Most of them are targeted at quite young children. This one deals with basic mathematics, so... Nice and colourful, uh, very simple, uh, drill and test type exercises. So this is quite typical of the sort of educational product you might have got with the, uh, the computer. Now the last one I want to show you is this game. This is a Micro Surgeon. And I was impressed by this. There's no sound, but the graphics are are pretty good for a machine of this era. We've got a split screen here into four it's four parts of the screen and it's quite complex. I have no idea how to play this game but uh, as I say I was quite impressed with the graphics. This is considering uh, that these machines don't have sprites. Not too bad. Here you can see the cartridges I've got for the machine. Now the bulk of these cartridges, by far the bulk of them, were donated by a TI-99 4A enthusiast who lives in the USA. He mailed them over to me. His name's Jim Fetzner. So just a shout out uh, to Jim and a thank you uh, for his donation. Uh, Jim also sent that plastic strip that was missing from my TI-99 4A. This is the one with the, uh, uh, the words that equate to a function key combinations. He sent that over as well, so big thanks to you, Jim. Now, I usually finish these sessions with a look at any manuals I've got, but uh, I don't have any manuals, at least hard copy ones, for this machine. I've still got to acquire them, so we'll skip right to the summary. So what are my final thoughts on the TI-994A? One negative thing you may read about the machine is a slow version of BASIC. It is slower compared to other machines of the era, largely because of the way it was interpreted. In the day, and in the market it was aimed for though, I don't think this would, would have been important. Most of the basic programming that people would have done would have been to learn the language where speed wasn't critical. I'm picking the computer was mostly used with its games and its educational cartridges. The TI-994A was a popular home computer for the time and sold over 2.8 million units between 1981 and early 1984, when it was discontinued. However, history doesn't remember it as the moderately successful product it was. It's largely remembered as the loser in the home computer wars of 1982-1984. Texas Instruments got into a price war with Commodore International with their VIC-20. Also, the more capable Commodore 64 was creeping into its price band. This saw the TI... 994A being sold at a loss just to hold market share. The computer was more expensive to make than the VIC-20 and although the final variant of the TI-994A had a cheaper plastic case, 
It just couldn't stop the rot. After losing $100 million in the second quarter of 1983, then $330 million in the third quarter, TI threw in the towel and announced it was quitting the home computer market altogether. As the first big name to do so, it was noteworthy, but other manufacturers would also find life at the low end of the market hard to sustain. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, these machines are hard to find in New Zealand. One of the reasons is they never actually got here until they were discontinued. Essentially, they were dumped here at a discount price. This title on this review article, Dead on Arrival, from the February 1984 edition of New Zealand Bits and Bytes, says it all. I'm not sure when the machines came into Europe, whether it was when they were at their zenith in the USA or whether it was uh, later on like New Zealand. Anyway, although dead on arrival by the time it got to New Zealand and remembered by history largely as the loser in a discount slugging match, to me it's a classic computer and I'm glad to have it. Well, thanks for joining me for this look at the Texas Instruments TI-99 4A. Until next time, keep well, and we'll see you in the next video.